escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. So he killed those false prophets. False prophets are not just a pain. They are a threat to people's eternal life. And so Elijah knew what God had commanded him to do. And notice verse 41 now. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go up. He said, King Ahab, go up. Eat and drink, for there's a sound of the rushing of rain. Has it rained how long now? Three years. Three, years, three and a half years. If we're going to go by James chapter 5. It hadn't rained in three and a half years. And Ahab said, Elijah says to Ahab, You need to get on up top of Mount Carmel, and you need to eat and drink some, because there's fixing to be a big flood of rain coming very soon. Now, Tonight, as we talk about praying for God to move, I'm going to give you really two things to think about tonight. And we're going to kind of flesh some of these out while we're even here tonight. Number one is this, church. We need to learn to stand on the promises of God. I want you to think back to 1 Kings 17, 1. When Elijah went in before King Ahab and he says, Ahab, it is not going to rain, nor will there be dew on the ground until you hear the word from me, and I'm getting the word from the Lord God who creates everything. Elijah effectively took the key of faith and he locked the window of heaven tighter than a drum. No rain and no dew for three and a half years. What happened in 1 Kings chapter 18? The, the word of the Lord came to Elijah again. God spoke to Elijah. Elijah was listening. And in verse 2, Elijah obeyed by going to find King Ahab. So my question is this. How is it that Elijah knew stuff that other people didn't know? And the answer is, Elijah listened to the voice of the Lord. Elijah listened to the voice of the Lord. He knew what other people did not know because he listened to God when God would speak to him. And Elijah had faith in what God spoke to him as being the truth from God. This morning in our community group, and if you had Gospel Project, this is where you were today as we finished up this quarter and we jump into uh, next Sunday into our next section of study in the redemptive history uh, of God through the pages of the Bible, which is a fascinating study. And, 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 and this morning, our lesson was awesome. And as always, we didn't have time to plumb the depths of it. But there were a few questions that were there in our workbook. And I wanted to, to, to share some of those with us to think about tonight because, listen, you and I, listen now, we need to, we need to stand on the promises of God. In fact, we sang that hymn tonight, and that's point number one. We need to stand on the promises of God. This is what you and I need to do. Now, to, to be able to do that, we have to know them, amen? You can't stand on something if you don't know it's there, right? And so the, 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 the statement in our workbook was this. The Word of God has never been so accessible as it is today. Think about that. And we discussed in our community group how many of our people in our community group this morning, they had the Bible on their phone. More than one translation of it. Many of you in this room tonight, these young people up the Bible, they have the Bible on their phone. That's how the younger generation does it. I, I'm not a part of that. I'm trying to be a part of them. I've got some Bible translations on my phone. Amen. And so, but it's a good thing to have. And especially like when the lights are turned out and you're somewhere, and you can turn on your phone and you'll be able to still see the Scripture. It's really paid off a lot of time. But the Bible is more accessible today than ever before in human history. There was a time when the Bible was chained to pulpits in churches. It was even in a language that the common people in that country couldn't even read. You grew up in Germany under Roman Catholicism and Lutheranism before Lutheranism took, took root. It, the Bible was written in what language? Anybody know? Latin. Latin. Did most Germans read Latin? No, a lot of the German priests didn't read Latin. Martin Luther found that out. He was disgusted by their lack of understanding of the Word of God. They simply listened to what they said in the church and passed that down to the folks. It became a form of bondage. But I will tell you, the Bible has never been more accessible to people, to me and you and the young people, as it is to our kids on their tablets right there. They, they have Bible games that ask questions. Sometimes come to church, they'll be asking, uh, they, play, they play hangman with Bible question answers. That's pretty cool. 
But the access to the Bible and Bible knowledge is today like it's never been before. And here was the question in our, in our workbook. But are we hearing his voice? Are we hearing God speak? Even though the word of the Lord is not rare today as it was in Eli's day and Samuel's day. You can find the Word of the Lord on the internet. You can find it on phones. You can download apps. You can buy copies. And in our country, there's no fear of, of, of reprimand for that. But are we hearing the voice of God? Another question that we had was this. It was a very good one concerning standing on the promises of God. Number two, what was the last thing God spoke to you through the Bible? Now that question when we did our lesson earlier this past week, getting ready for Sunday, uh, that question shook us a little bit. What is the last thing God spoke to your heart about through the reading of Scripture? You see, when we come to read the Bible, it's not just reading it so we can check, okay, Pastor Jay asked, I did it, man. I, I read it five days this week. I read it all, every day this week. I, I read the daily bread and the devotion that goes with it. Man, I'm, I'm checking off my boxes. Well, that's a start, isn't it? But what did the Lord say to you when you read his word? See, that's the ultimate goal is not reading and checking off on your Bible. reading. Back. And I've told you before, I'm a checker of boxes. I'm wired. If I got an assignment, I'm going to get it done. If I was learning piano, I'm going to give it my best. I'm not. And you can be very thankful I'm not going to try. But, but, I, but I'm, if I were going to do it now, I'm going to be up early working on it. I'm going to stay up late. That's me. I did my homework first. Then watch television. Then play because I'm a driven person. And what carries over in my Bible time, sometimes my God time, is I'm driven to get it done. And I have to rush to get through. And then I can check off my box for the day and I'm thinking I'm done. But I'm not. Because I need to hear the voice of the Lord speak to me just like Elijah had the voice of the Lord speak to him. Now, I get it through written words. I didn't have the audible voice of God say, Hey, Elijah, it's time, son. Get, pack your little traveling bag and head back to Ahab. Don't have it that way. I got something better. And you have something better. You have the infallible, inspired, written word of God. And if you want to hear God speak to you out loud, read the Bible out loud and God is speaking to you. Out loud. That's how that works. That was, that was the question number two that I jotted down from our lesson this morning. What was the last thing God spoke to you? Do you need to think about that? And maybe you can't answer it right now. Maybe it's been so long since you had time with the Lord in the Word. You need to say, Lord, I, I'm hearing from you right now through your Word. I need to repent of not being in your Word. And you know what He'll do? He'll forgive you. And he'll meet you right where you are. And you can jump in right now tonight or in the morning, whenever that time works for you. But number three, how do you prepare your heart to receive God's word? That was a great question in our study guide this morning as well. How do you prepare your heart to receive God's word? You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, if we rush into our God time with the Lord, and we haven't asked him, and we haven't like confessed sin. And we haven't said, Lord, search my heart and know me and, and show me the unclean things within my heart, my life, my mind, my attitude. You know, we, we have to, first of all, have a plan. We have to then work the plan and we have to pray and say, Lord, please forgive me, cleanse me of my sins, speak to me, Lord. Psalm 119, verse 18, um, you know, talks about. Uh, uh, Open my eyes, open my eyes, O oh Lord, that I might behold wonderful things out of your law. Psalm 119, 8. That's a great verse from Scripture to pray. Uh, you know, open my eyes that I might behold, see, lock my eyes onto things out of your law. That's a great verse. Psalm 119, verse 18. So how do you prepare your heart? To receive. God, let me encourage you to do this. Ask God to forgive you of your sins, show you where you've fallen short. Ask Him to forgive you, to cleanse you. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you need to have a plan, 
A part of that plan is to be praying and saying, Lord, open my eyes that I can see wonderful things from your word. That's Psalm 1, 19, 18. Lord, please forgive me of my sins and my attitudes that are not uh, in, in agreement with the gospel of Jesus Christ that don't please you. Please forgive me, God. And I'll tell you another quick thing you ought to have is an accountability partner. It might be your wife. In 432, we encourage, of course, husbands and wives to do something together during the week. And what Pam and I tend to do is we, we try to do our workbook. We, we study. We'll do the introduction in session one. That happened this past week. I told the Winston night group, I think it was, we started uh, Monday night. And uh, uh, we were falling asleep in the chair up in my study while our little ones were falling asleep back in our bed. So uh, we just decided to wait. And on Tuesday night, we, we finished out section one. And then later in the week, we did section two and then section three. And we were ready for our lesson this morning. But that's our plan. You've got to have a plan. You've got to pray as you begin to read and say, Lord, speak to me and forgive me and cleanse me and help my mind and my heart be attuned to you. And it's good to have an accountability partner. So, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't read any of our lessons this week yet. It's been a crazy week. And we, have, we, don't, we don't condemn anybody, right? Don't do that in your community group. But, but because, I mean, with our young couples and they're working overtime and this and that, got little babies and trying to have babies and everything else in there, I mean, it's just a busy bunch. But, but God is, should be preeminent, right? That's what the Bible says, Colossians 1, that in all things he might be preeminent. That means number one. And so, have a plan. Pray and ask God to forgive you of your sins and to open your eyes so you can behold wonderful things in his word. And then have an accountability partner. Have somebody that would just say, what's, God's, what's God teaching you this week? And this, if you're a husband in the room, this is a great time for you to, to man up tonight and say, okay, by God's grace, we're going to do this. We're going we're gonna to have a family time where, where I talk to my beloved about this. I mean, you may make her teeth fall out if they're not, like, in, in there good by doing that. But, but you ought to say, you know, Pastor Jay taught on that tonight. And, and, and really, you know, we're kind of in the desert spiritually. We're not growing. We're, we're, you know, and really, if you're not moving forward, you are backing up. There is no standing still, really. It doesn't work that way. We're either moving forward in the grace of God or we're not. And we're supposed to be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so, uh, number one tonight, we need to stand on the promises of God. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment, and we're getting ready to move to point number two. That's where we're going to spend some time praying tonight. Here we go. All right? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. We thank you that you spoke to Elijah, <clears throat> and you had it recorded in your holy word tonight, the Bible. And Father, we thank you that you speak to us. Father, I pray that you would help each of us in this room, every man and woman and young person, Lord, tonight, every child have a desire to know you and your word and to stand on your promises. And Father, I pray you help us all do some soul searching tonight. Are we, are we actually hearing the voice of the living God as we read the Bible? And Father, teach us to prepare our hearts to receive your awesome truth. Lord, help us and work in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Point number one, stand on the promises of God. Point number two, we need to kneel. We need to kneel in prayer to God. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 18, notice the verses here. Look, notice verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. Now, again, I have tried this, and some of y'all have heard me preach this. It's a little different than all tonight, but, but I have tried to do this. And, and when I did, I got down and I couldn't get up. So, I mean, he was extremely broken and humble. It's a picture of, of bowing yourself before God. And it says he bowed on his knees and he put his face, his head between his knees. Now, um, I know some people in this room who can do that and then recover from that on their own. I can't right now even do that. If you force me to, I couldn't go that low. All right? I could not. But the main thing is this. Elijah was poured out before God with brokenness and humility and concern for the people of Israel that God had called him to be a prophet to. 
because they were, they were following after the Baals and they were following after Asherah. Their own king had married a woman. Her name is Jezebel, who was leading the nation into false worship of Baal and Asherah. Those two, the male god and the female god, would get together and you can work on that for yourself. But, but that's what they did. So they had all this, 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 this sexual immorality that went along with their religion. And it broke Elijah's heart because they were breaking the commands of God. Just like he said to Ahab, I have not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the males. Well, Elijah goes up on the top of Mount Carmel there in Israel, kneels down, and, and before there's ever one raindrop that will fall from the sky, I picture his face wet with streaming tears as he prays for God to send rain. Now, the, the, the actual text of 1 Kings 18 doesn't tell us what he prayed for. But James 5, again, tells us it had to be rain. And in the context of the story itself, we know it had to be. He's praying for God to send rain. And God answers his prayer. God moved. Just as Elijah took the key of faith and locked the windows of heaven, Elijah takes the key of faith by God's grace and he unlocks the windows of heaven and God sends rain and refreshment upon a parched, dry land of death. Not only spiritual death, which caused the problem, but also the physical death that came from people not having water for three and a half years. And our land has been many times in desperate situations. In fact, uh, I was researching today. In 1857, there's a man whose name was Jeremiah Lanfear. Have any of y'all ever heard of Jeremiah Lanfear before? You can Google it. <coughs> Jeremiah Lanfear was a businessman. I want you to hear me carefully here. He was a businessman. A businessman. Who had a burden for the lostness in this country. You say, you're the only pastor in the house. Well, see, my, my main illustration tonight from history and then I knew no pastor. He was a businessman in New York City. You see, our nation, if you know American history, at that time, the conversions reported from the churches in the 1840s and 50s were slim to none. Churches in America had had the second great awakening that had happened in the 1820s and 30s had fizzled on out. And at this point in time, people were taking religion and God for granted, and they were working hard. They, they were, they, they were, they, the, the gold rush had, had happened in California by this time. And the, the Industrial Revolution had hit America, and so there were now factories in the big cities. And so folks were, were in the factories now, and the cities were beginning to grow really huge for the first time because of the Industrial Revolution and that development. And then you had the gold rush out west and people rushing out there to, 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 to pan for gold and to mine for gold. And, and so people's minds in our country were far away from God who had shed his grace on thee, as we sang this morning. Their minds were on the things of this earth and the things of this world. And so spiritually, the, the churches were not growing. The churches were not reaching people. In fact, the people in America were pretty uh, nonchalant. They, they didn't really mind the church. They didn't, the church didn't bother them. They were doing their thing, and they were happy doing their thing. But this man, Jeremiah Lanfear, this businessman in New York City, on September 23rd, 1857, he went into a room in the old Dutch Reformed Church in New York City. He knelt down and prayed by himself, and he said this, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now, I know that's King James, but that's what he prayed. This was 1857. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? To do. And also in his prayer, he said, Lord, whatever you want, please move and do it, Lord. 
Jeremiah Lanfear felt burdened to begin a prayer meeting for businessmen and women in New York City. So he printed up these little flyers, these little leaflets. He printed up hundreds of them, and he passed them out all through New York City. And on the appointed Wednesday at noon, he, he rushes in with great eager expectation. His heart is about to burst. He goes in there, and at noon, he's the only one in there. But he kneels down and he prays. For God to move and to save people and to do a work in the country again. And Jeremiah Lanfear didn't give up. He was praying. But at 30 minutes into the hour, the historical record tells us, 30 minutes into the hour, one man walked in and knelt down and started praying. Ten minutes later, another set of footsteps come in and another person came in and knelt down. Five minutes later, another person. By the end of the first hour, by one o'clock on that first Wednesday prayer meeting, there were six people in that room. Now, I'm kind of wired like, I might be thinking, well, Lord, you know, you really must not have told me to do this because, you know, I've been praying about it, I've been excited about it, but we passed out hundreds of flyers about this thing, and six people came. But not Jeremiah Lanfear. That next Wednesday, he showed up at noon, and 30 people were there. By the end, by the end, of October. Three large rooms in that building were filled with people praying for God to move and save people and, and <coughs> change hearts and lives and save marriages that are on the rocks in all of these things. Uh, in fact, by March 1858, there were 6,000 people praying in New York City. Listen, every day. You see, by the end of October, there was over a thousand people praying there in that little prayer meeting he'd started. The first day had how many? Six? A thousand people were gathered, and they weren't preaching and teaching. They came in and they sat down and these people prayed. That's what they did. There wasn't doctrinal teaching about Baptist and baptism and second coming issues. They came and they prayed for God to pour out his mercy and grace and conviction on the people in New York City and in America. And so after October ended, Lanfear said, you know, we probably need to start meeting every day. And that's what he did. In November of 1857, they started meeting every day at noon. And that's where it was by six months after they started, there were 6,000 people praying every day in New York City for God to save people. In fact, by May of 1858, by May of 1858, 50,000 people had trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in New York City alone. But you see... The Prayer Revival of 1857, as it's called. This is how you can look it up, too. Not only in Jeremiah Lanfear, but you can look it up as the Prayer Revival of 1857 through 1859. The Prayer Revival of 1857 began, and it spread from New York City to Philadelphia, to Chicago, to Cleveland, to Detroit, to Pittsburgh, to Philadelphia. It even spread to Mobile, Alabama. New Orleans, and all the way to the Pacific Coast. By, by estimation, there were over 50,000 people praying daily for God to do a work in America. And historians who figure this up, ever how they do it, they tell us that one million people were converted to Christ through the prayer revival of 1857. And so you look at the situation and you think things are desperate, and they are. But when God moves, folks, God's people get desperate to see his glory unleashed. Amen? See, when God moves, God's people get desperate. When God moves, his, his word through his spirit change and transform lives. People get saved. Marriages are strengthened. Parents get their priorities right and put the Lord first in their lives. And churches come back to life. Instead of being unnoticed as people drive by, people will sense the power and the presence of God. And I'm here to tell you tonight, this can happen again. 
You see, we're doing this on a night, probably our lowest Sunday night of the year right here. And what I am preaching is perhaps one of the most important messages ever preached in this book. Because we are dependent upon God. We are desperate for God to move in our midst. And so we must stand on the promises of God in the Word of God. And we need to kneel in prayer to God and ask Him to work and to move and to save and to restore and to breathe life into Crawford Baptist Church and to breathe life into the other churches that we know of in our area. First Sims and Three Circle and First Baptist Snow Road and First Wilmer and Wilmer Baptist and all these churches, Moffat, Moffat Road Baptist Church, we, we are not here to compete with these churches or to put these churches down or, or the Methodist Church and the Assembly of God Church and the Church of God Church and the Traditional Baptist Church. We're not here to, to rag them and to put them down. We ought to be praying for God to pour His Spirit out on all the people of God. And so what I want us to do for a while tonight is spend some time praying before we finish out. I have my eye on the clock. You need not worry about it. But I want to share this with you. I put it on Facebook this afternoon. Listen to what Samuel Chadwick had to say. The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. The devil laughs at our toil, that's hard work, and he mocks at our wisdom but he trembles when we pray. Jonathan Edwards said, when God has something great to accomplish for his church, it's his will that there should precede it extraordinary prayers of his people. And so tonight, we come together for some moments tonight to, so the devil can tremble a little bit. We want the devil to tremble because we are trusting God. We're asking God to move and to work mightily in this place and in our lives and in our families and to save our teenagers and to save our young people and to bless the Atlanta mission team as they're finishing up tonight and in the morning and driving back tomorrow afternoon back here to Mobile, Alabama and that their lives will be changed forever because of what they experienced on mission in Atlanta, Georgia this week. You can pray for Philadelphia. You can pray for Sims. You can pray for our nation. You can pray for whatever the Holy Spirit puts on your heart to pray for. And so I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. Can you do that with me? Let's bow our heads. And close. We're not going to put anybody on the spot here at all. We're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. And tonight, would you just pray? Right where you are. For those things the Holy Spirit's impressing on your heart to pray for. Would you pray for God to be supreme in your own life? Would you repent and confess attitudes and words, sins of action, sins of inaction? Maybe you're holding a grudge against somebody or some folks. You may not feel like letting go and forgiving, but say, God, by my act of my will, I choose to forgive them tonight. Help me change the way I feel toward these people. The Holy Spirit is hindered in working in the church of Jesus Christ today because so many of the professing saints of God have bitterness and unrepentant hearts. And would you join me in praying for God to, to break through those hard hearts and that he would give forgiveness and restore unto people the joy of their salvation tonight. If you're a grumbler, there's a reason for that. Sin. And we need to confess it. The joy of the Lord is to be our strength. There's some folks that make their way in churches, they all be crawling in. They don't have the joy of the Lord. But He is our strength, and He's a person. He's Jesus. So would you pray, young people in the back of me and other adults, and would you just pray all over this room tonight? And as we have a time where you sit and pray for a few moments, I'm going to just, I've mentioned this to some, if you want to just come and lead us in prayer, this microphone, 
We can turn it on and you can lead us in prayer and that way people will hear you. We'd love for you to do. We want everybody to hear. If you come lead, we want you to be heard. But if you're led to come lead, I'd invite some of the men, women even, whatever, upper room, men and women pray together. I want to invite you to come and lead us in prayer tonight. We're going to bow before the Lord. I'm going to get quiet. And if the Spirit prompts you to come up and lead us in prayer for Sims, for, for the homes and marriages, for children, for, for our Atlanta team, for the Philadelphia team, the Builders Mission team, Vacation Bible schools coming up. We gave out 2,700. That's 2,700 invitations this week in the four feeder elementary schools in our area. And if you want to come and pray for VBS teachers and workers and more workers and for boys and girls to come and hear the good news of Jesus, whatever the Spirit prompts, would you do that? I'm going to get quiet and pray, and you have freedom to come as you need. Genesis to Revelations, you promised you'd never leave us and you'd never forsake us. That you'd hear our prayers when we pray. I claim that promise tonight, Lord. And I know you're here. And I know you hear our prayers. And I just ask you to bless our church. Bless every effort for all the mission trips. Please, you keep us safe. And I pray, Lord, that we'll see results from that. You're the one that does the saving. You're the one that does the forgiving. And we're the ones that let's be willing to let you work. I ask you to bless my family. Save my son. Yeah. He needs to get. He needs to get you in his life. And you know, Lord, I pray every day that you do that. And I publicly now I want to pray that you save me.
best friend I've ever had. You're always there for me when I fail and when I'm weak. And it's, it's only you that, that makes me strong. And I, I ask you for that help. As a leader of my family, that I live my life according to your will. Thank you for my brothers and sisters and what they mean to me. Bless us all, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you will move with this church. I pray, Lord, that the cars coming down the road would feel your Holy Spirit to draw, draw them in here. And that we'll see somebody saved, Lord, soon. Do it, Lord. Do it for your honor and your glory. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Name above all names. not just to the children, but to their families as well. God, not for our glory, not for, not for anything, but other than your glory. Lord, I love you, and I thank you for this church family that I have that supports Vacation Bible School in every way that they can, God. I pray that you would impress upon all of their hearts to pray daily from now until Vacation Bible School starts and through, throughout the week of Vacation Bible School just to pray for the children, for the workers, for the parents, for everyone involved. Lord, it's a huge outreach, and I just pray that you would help us to understand the impact that it can have. God, I thank you. I thank you for my salvation. I thank you for sending your son to die on the cross to save me. I thank you for my family. I thank you for my church family. 
Lord, I pray that you would just be with us this week and help us to take away from this night and from this day as much as we can to remember to always, always make that time for you, Lord. In your name I pray. God, I, uh, I first just want to thank you for this church, God, these people, and just the opportunity to, to be with them each week, God, uh, more than once a week, God, and I, I thank you for each one in this room, God, but as I sit out here, God, I'm just hurt, God, I have, I'm guilty, I have been bitter, and I've questioned you, there have been days when I, I know your word, and I know the truth, and I, I've lived it, God, but I still, I still question you at times, and I know that your plan is sovereign, God, but it hasn't made it any easier. God, in this church family, God, a, a magnitude and a group of people this big, God, we love you, but, but we have needs, and, and they hurt, and we've, we've cried, and we've suffered. And God, I know, God, I know that by your son's wounds, we have all already been healed. I know it. And whether that be physical, emotional, spiritual, God, I pray that you do that, God. Make it known to us. I pray that you show us that healing, God. I know I know that you've done it, but I just I think sometimes in our lives and then we get caught up in our in our work and in our everything else we got going on, God, we just fail to see it. And this church right now, God, it just seems we've for lack of a better word, we, we're in a lull. We're gasping. God, I want you to fill our lungs up. Let us breathe you in, God. We're anxious. We're waiting. We want it, God. And I pray that you be with all these trips, this, the Atlanta team that's gone, the, the Philadelphia team that I'm a part of. I pray that you be with them in vacation Bible school and Billy and Sarah and the builders' trips, God. God, you have your hand in all this, God. And I told you, God, I, I don't want to question you. I want you to take that, that emptiness on those days, God, and I don't want to put it outside of mine. I don't want to have it. I want you to fill me up personally, God. Help me to be a light. You called me to lead in some way, shape, or form, God, and I want to do it, God. I want to do whatever you need me to do, and I want this church to answer that question, too. God, what will you have us do? God, I think we're ready to do it. I just pray that you help us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come to you tonight in all your grace, your mercy, Lord, the forgiveness that you give each and every one of us. Lord, I pray as the upcoming day tomorrow, Lord, for each and every one in the military, those that have been lost, Lord, those that are dealing with those overseas, Lord, I ask you to just give them a peace and love sin. Lord, I pray as Jerry did for each and every mission trip that's going this summer, Lord. We get so caught up in the hustle and bustle of the summer through vacations and mission trips, Lord, but I ask you, Lord, to just keep our eyes focused on you and the real meaning behind each and every one of these trips. I pray that you soften the hearts of the children as we try to pour into them through vacation Bible school, the Philadelphia mission trip, Lord. Lord, I just ask you that you will... Uh, just soften their hearts. Give their ears just the ability to listen 
to receive the message, Lord, the great message that you have given us to spread amongst this community and this world. I pray of those outside of this church, Lord, in the community, Lord, that have either lost you or, Lord, that have never had you. Ask you, Lord, to just draw them near, if not to Crawford, Lord, to any church, Lord, that they will get plugged in somewhere and help spread this great message that you've given us. Lord, I just thank you for this church and everything that you've done for me and my family. Lord, the folks of this church, Lord, have been so gracious and open arms to me and my wife, Lord. I thank you for the pastors, the staff, Lord, as you bless them in all their endeavors. Lord, I just want to pray for the youth, Lord. I know it's summer, but we are still in high school, and this is going to be my senior year upcoming, and we have all the chances every day to shine our light, and I, you can tell the ones in our youth group, they shine their light, and it is bright, Lord, but there's also some that are drifting, Lord, and I just want to pray for them, and I pray that we can just work in their hearts and they can continue to seek you, Lord, and I just want to thank you for this church that I can feel comfortable shaking and crying in front of, Lord. And I just want to pray for church camp. And I know I'm not going to be able to be there, Lord, but I'm going to be praying for them the whole time. And I pray that they continue to grow and see you, Lord. And I pray that you can just show them the way. And, Lord, thank you for my family, Lord. And not just my immediate family, Lord. I'm thanking you for this family you've given me that I can feel comfortable walking in front of the in front of the whole church and knowing that they love me even if they don't even know my name. So thank you. teaching me in your word to forgive others. And I know there are people in my life that I've had trouble forgiving. God, I, I thank you for reminding me in your word that if we don't forgive those, that you can't forgive us. And Lord, thank you for helping me to forgive them. God, help me to pray for them when it's so difficult. <coughs> God, thank you for reminding me in your word that I can trust you no matter what. That you are in control of my life, my family, and I can trust that and have peace and comfort in knowing that you're going to take care of everything. And I trust you, my Heavenly Father. Thank you for your love and your forgiveness and your grace. God, I just pray that you'd help me to be what you want me to be. When I stumble and fall every single day, I pray you would pick me up and guide my steps, Father. I pray, Father, for my son, that you would guide him. 
Father, I will lift him up to you. And I trust you, Father, that you will help me to know what to do in times of trouble. You have never failed me. You've always answered my prayers. And you have always made my cup overflow with your blessings. And I will never forget you being there for me in the times of trouble. God, thank you for the people you've put in my life who've encouraged me and loved me and prayed for me and my family. I know I don't deserve it, Lord, but I'm so thankful for it. And God, I'm so thankful for the times of trouble that have drawn me near to you. It's difficult sometimes, but Father, you bless me so much through it. And I thank you for that and for you teaching me each day. that you'd be watching over the team that's in Atlanta on the mission trip, that you would bless them, Father, and I pray that you would use them to bless others and to draw others near to you, Father. And I pray for what you're already doing there, and I just pray that you would protect them as they travel home tomorrow. And God, I pray for our church. There's so many in our church that are hurting, there's so much pain and suffering, Father. There's illness. We have people who are lost inside of our church. And, and those who have lost loved ones, Father, I lift them up to you. I know they're precious to you. And God, I just lift them up to you and trust that you would bless them and draw them to you. I pray for the children during vacation Bible school, Father. They are so precious. Father, we thank you for the children in our church. And I pray that you would help us to grow them and nurture them spiritually and help us to be good examples to the young ones in our church. To help us to be godly examples so that they would know what you want in their lives and help the teachers as they teach them at that Bible school. Father, I lift up our youth to you, Father. There's so many and it's so hard to be a teenager them all up to you. I love them so much. I give them to you, Father. Whatever their needs are, you know what their struggles are. I just lift them up to you and trust that you teach them, Father, through your word. I pray, Father, that you would always help me to be the example that I need to be. Help me to love others the way you want. 